I'd like to introduce First Draft's U.S. Director, Dr. Claire Wardle. Thank you very much and welcome everyone to day two of Infotech 2020. We are so thrilled to kick things off with this session titled Election Reporting in Unprecedented Times and that seems somewhat of an understatement. And this session is, we've created this in partnership with our friends at ProPublica and their project Election Land. We didn't advertise this session, we didn't tweet about it, we actually wanted this to be a space for an honest and open conversation with partners and different newsrooms that are working on this election. Because again, uh, this is unprecedented and many of us are working in situations where we are being targeted. So that was why we, we did that. Um, and so I'm hoping that this can lead to a, to a really useful conversation. So first I would like to welcome the amazing Jessica Huseman, who I have known now for four years because we met around the first election land project in 2016. Jessica covers voting rights and election administration for ProPublica. She is the lead reporter for their election land project. And as I said, we partnered with ProPublica back in 2016 and then again in 2018 on the election land project. And if you haven't signed up for it yet, um, I really recommend that you do so. And at the end of this session, we're going to bring in Rachel Glickhouse, the partner manager for ProPublica's election land to talk about how you can join. But the project helps hundreds of newsrooms across the US cover ballot access issues in real time. And so I asked Jessica if she would interview the equally amazing Tammy Patrick, who I met a couple of years ago because she did a session for us where we ran a similar event. And she really does know absolutely everything <laughs> about voting. And so uh, Tammy is a senior advisor to the elections program at Democracy Fund, where she leads the effort to foster voter centric election systems. And in 2013, uh, Tammy was selected by President Obama to serve as commissioner for the Presidential Commission on Election Administration. Previously, she was federal compliance officer for the Maricopa County Elections Department, where she was there for 11 years. And she served in that role almost 2 million voters in the greater Phoenix Valley. So I think probably has a lot to say about um, the problems that we might be seeing in that particular part of the country. But I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. She is much smarter than me and she knows which questions to ask. But um, over to you, Jessica. Well, I don't think any of that's true, but I'll kick it off anyway. Um, well, Tammy, I've known you for some time. I'm very excited to chat with you today. Um, so I wanted to start off um, and talk just a little bit about the state of Kentucky. Um, uh, this was a really, this was a, this was a, a bit of a, a news story uh, as, as the, the primary ramped up in Kentucky. People were very concerned about the way that the state had chosen to handle the pandemic. Um, and specifically in the Louisville area, there was a bit of a viral concern that 600,000 people were assigned to a single polling location. Um, and so I just wanted you to sort of talk about the uh, veracity of such a claim. Um, and then maybe we can get into a little bit about how that might impact voters and the way that they perceive um, the system and their confidence in it. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. It's always lovely to, um, to talk with you. I miss seeing you in person as along with everyone else, but this is the next best thing. Um, so I think one of the, the main concerns when we talk about covering elections is it's really easy to just say one polling place for 600,000 people. And what does that mean? But there's more of a story there. And so the question is, how can we tell the story accurately hold election officials and other decision makers to account, but not scare off voters in a way that makes it seem like any decision that's being made is being made in order to make it more difficult to vote. So the story in Kentucky really was, they mailed out ballot applications to every registered voter. They had more voters vote by mail than ever before. The one location in Kentucky was actually open for a really long time before election day and allowed voters more opportunities. So even in this pandemic, I think it's it's important that we talk about the options that voters have. And that's where the, the balance of the math can get can get sticky. So oftentimes people want to say, well, a jurisdiction had a thousand voting locations before, and now they only have 400 or 500. But to a voter, when you have a precinct-based polling location, you have one option, just one. But when you move to something like an early voting um, situation or vote centers, 
you have all of those options. And really in this moment, we wanna make sure that voters understand what their options are and that they're able to choose what they feel they need to do in order to still participate, but keep their friends and families and themselves safe in a global pandemic. So I think that's part of where the, the story gets muddled at times. Um, the other challenge around when we talk about voting opportunities, way too often, we always focus on the deadline. Tomorrow's the last day. We don't want anyone to wait in this situation because when we wait, we introduce chance as being um, a, an obstacle. So it broke my heart and I think the heart of every election official in the country when we saw people running when the, the doors were closed um, you know, at the Coliseum in Louisville. Um, we don't want voters to wait. We don't want them to wait till election day. We don't want them to wait until the last hours of election day. We don't want them to wait to request a ballot until the deadline because that's leaving way too many things um, that could inhibit their ability to successfully vote. So that's why I think um, if we can, can pivot and think about the way in which we report elections, um, it's gonna be really more helpful to the voters, particularly in this moment you know, in a, in a global pandemic. Right. And, you know, I mean, th that's such a good point, because I think that there was so much context with that 600,000 number assigned to one polling location that journalists just didn't really report out. And what we had is, is you know, there was a, a very popular voting rights journalist who tweeted that out. And then LeBron James got a hold of it. And then Ilhan Omar got a hold of it. And it became this mass storm of anger around 600,000 people being assigned to one polling location. But about a fourth of those people had already voted by mail. Several of them had voted early and turnout is never 100%. So we we're actually talking about 100,000 people on one day. And if you consider that that location was in a gigantic convention center and had multiple places where you could go vote, it was just context free. And so what concerns me, and I'd love to hear you your perspective on this, is that I have been trying for a long time to get reporters to see themselves as part of the election administration system rather than just observers of it. Um, because you know, if you're a voter, you're not going to necessarily know to go to your Secretary of State's website to get information on what voter ID you should carry with you or where your polling location is or where the lines are in the vote centers when you choose to go vote. But you are going to go to your local television station or your local newspaper's website to get that information because that's been a source of information for you in the past. And so in that way, I feel like journalists are, are very much part of the system. And so we do have to toe that very sort of fine and, and faded line that you were talking about earlier between, you know, holding people accountable and not scaring voters off with poorly reported information that's going to unnecessarily make them lose confidence in the system. So, you know, as a former election administrator, I wonder if you sort of have a, a better sense of where that line is. Like, at what point should journalists feel free to sort of like ring all the bells and blow all the horns, um, even if it means that people are become concerned about the validity of the outcome or the competence of their local election officials? So I think that the, the, the line is, does get blurry. I think you're absolutely right. So for me, I would say that the, the time when, um, when it's right and ripe to sound the alarms is after you've talked to a number of people from a variety of perspectives and then make that judgment call. So if you sound the alarm and you have not talked to a single election official at the state or local level, you're being premature. Um, so let's think about a place where um, maybe they have no polling places in one whole section of the city, um, or there's this huge reduction in locations, and it seems like it's being done for some sort of, of malfeasance or ineptitude, whatever you want to call it. It's important to find out why were polling places being closed? Why did they go to just one massive location? And the, the true story here is that elections rely upon our communities. So election officials and the polling locations, whether it's a church, a place of worship, somebody's garage, um, those places are being offered up to the public, usually for no pay. And under many circumstances in many states, there's no legal authority that the election official has 
to say to the owner of the community center um, at, an, at an HOA that you need to let us in as a polling location again. So it's always up to the goodness of the heart of the person managing. And what we've seen so far this year is that places of worship have said, you know what, if we can't have our services, you won't be a polling place. Schools have said, if we can't have children come in, you can't be a polling place. So there are some jurisdictions where almost 100% of the facilities that they've relied upon year after year after year have said, no, you can't come back. The best case scenario I've heard has been about a quarter of the, of the polling locations. So that's where it's important to know, you're gonna hear one story um, from one audience and from one uh, source that's gonna tell you something that seems like it's, it's black and white and there's no, uh, no interpretation to be made. But that's where it's important that we consider and contemplate who do we consider our experts and are we getting um, information from enough sources that we can make an informed decision on what we report back to the audience. So when we think about Kentucky, I was watching that polling location in the week leading up to election day um, and they were tweeting out, it was vacant. There was hardly anybody there. And the reason why I think that that was an important um, an important moment for us is that we're going to see more polling locations like that this fall. We already know that other um, professional teams are offering up their coliseums, their arenas. Um, and, and quite frankly, when we think about social distancing and we think about the CDC recommendations for how many people you can have in a given space, it is not the case that um, we would even under normal circumstances be able to have the exact same number of polling locations. We would need more of them to get the right kind of throughput for the volume of voters. So that's why we really need to have stories that talk about what are the changes, what are the voters options these, this year, because it's going to look different. Um, there are states where you maybe couldn't vote in person before, before election day, states where you couldn't request a ballot um, by mail to be delivered to your house. So that's where it's going to be important that we make sure we're getting all of the right information. And, and as I said, if, if you're not talking to an election official to at least get their perspective on why certain things happened, um, then I think the story is, 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 is lacking. I think that's right. And, you know, it, it strikes me as somebody who's covered both fraud and suppression over the last four years, um, that the conversations about both things tend to have a little bit more in common than people give them credit for. Um, we have people who will call fraud when it's not fraud at all and, and a very basic concern. And then we have people who will call suppression when it just happens to be um, sort of an unavoidable problem that poll workers have to deal with, and this is the best route forward. Um, so I was really interested to sort of see a lot of stories about, quote unquote, voter suppression in the wake of closing polling locations and closing um, certain types of, of voting options for voters in the middle of this pandemic, um, when it strikes me that a lot of people probably had no choice. And so perhaps the effect is the same, right? The voter can't vote at this location, but it's not intentional suppression. And I think painting it as such gives vo gives voters the incorrect impression. So on, uh, you know, first, right, it makes them less confident in the people who are doing their best to make sure that polling locations that people don't want used can still be open. Um, as you said, right, the, most polling locations are private businesses or private churches or schools that can close at any time and don't have to be used as a polling location. Um, and then also we see obviously thousands and thousands of poll workers dropping out because they are particularly, you know, vulnerable to COVID-19. And so I think that calling those, calling the closure of polling places, if you know that it's because your county simply does not have the resources to open that location, is not as accurate as it could be. If we instead said this polling location is closed because X, then I think we're also robbing the count, like the community of a opportunity to help fix the problem, right? If all that the community knows is this polling location closed and they don't know that it's because the church that the polling location was supposed to be in decided to shut down entirely, or they don't know that it's because the vast majority of the poll workers in the location 
patient or elderly, then that robs people, younger people of the opportunity to volunteer to be poll workers because they don't know that they're necessary. That robs business owners of a chance to volunteer their location to be a poll polling location. And so I think that in reporting these things out without including all of the nuance behind them, we actually make it more difficult to solve the problem. Um, like, can you, or, or is there like a recommendation that you would have for all of the questions that someone should ask when they hear of a polling location closing? So I think that um, it's important that election officials, and this is something, so I, uh, I um, formerly when I was a federal compliance officer in Maricopa County, I did all of our submissions to DOJ and I had to explain why polling places were being closed, why they were being moved. Um, and so it's important that we capture the information, and the data on why these things occur so that we can be, can be totally transparent on why it's happening and when it's happening. Because that's the other piece here is that some of these changes can occur right up to and even on election day. So it can be the fact that when you um, are delivering the voting equipment on Monday for Tuesday's election, that's when the janitor comes out and says, no, you, you, we've got bingo tomorrow night. You can't, you can't do this or whatever the reason is. And bingo, I will tell you, used to be a big, a big reason why churches wanted to not be polling places. I'm just saying. Um, so I think that it's, it's one, it's important to, um, to ask if in fact a jurisdiction is tracking those reasons. Um, and in this moment, I've recommended to my former election official colleagues that we make sure that we're capturing what is the impact of COVID both on the um, voters, or I'm sorry, the um, poll workers who are calling in and saying, you know what, I can't work this time um, because of my age or my health situation, um, or those that don't just don't show up. Because that's part of the other challenge here is that you have individuals that will let you know they're not going to be able to do it, but some won't, um, and they just don't show up on election day. So I used to hire about 8,000 poll workers um, for a federal election, and I would be fully hired, all 8,000 ready to go a week before, and every election, at least a quarter of them would cancel. I'd refill and hire those, and then on election morning, I'd have hundreds and hundreds of others that wouldn't show up. So in this moment, we need to be asking questions around why are these polling places closing? You raised the perfect example, and that is not having sufficient individuals to staff the polling place. So we know that was a situation in Wisconsin for the primaries. They were they put it out there that you know they had 100, 200 polling places that had zero poll workers, um, and that's where getting that news out has been um, helpful to exactly what you mentioned in this moment where I think so much of the country and. and quite frankly, the world, we're feeling disengaged, we're feeling isolated. We want to be able to help make, um, make a difference in this moment. And so being able to let people know, you know what, if you are a business owner and you have a space that could be used as a polling place, offer it up to your local election offices. If you are someone who um, is healthy and can take on the role of being a poll worker, do that. Um, you know, there are a lot of things where we can help empower our communities to participate in the process. And, um, and that's really part of the challenge. Now, that is to say, if, if you're talking to an election official and they're like, why, I don't know why we moved all of these polling places, that's a problem. If you're talking to election officials and they say, because we heard, have heard this, we're moving it because it doesn't comply with the um, ADA, with the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is, um, then I would ask to see the survey. I would ask to see, okay, what parts of the ADA does this not comply with? And is it the case that you can't make remediation so that it complies on election day with a temporary ramp, with block, you know, propping open a door? There are things that jurisdictions can do. Um, and unfortunately, I think the, the situation I'm alluding to was in, uh, Georgia, and they hadn't surveyed um, the polling places. And so that's the sort of questions you can ask. And, um, and it's important to know if, in fact, it is the case that a location is not compliant and voters will have challenges going there. And if there's another place nearby, that's the other, the other question to ask is, when polling places are moved, how far away are they being moved? Um, you know, is it still aligned with you know, if you live in a city that has, or a place that has good public transportation, is there still public transportation access? Um, some of those kind of questions. So it's important that on the one hand, you have what are potential motivations, um, and then 
that's one question, right? Um, and then the other question, as you mentioned, are the outcomes. And right. it could be that you have the best of motivations and the best of intentions, but the outcomes can be problematic. And that's where we need to figure out if the outcomes are changing the ability for a voter to participate, if it's putting obstacles in their way, what can we do to overcome those obstacles and make sure that they have the information they need to make informed choices? Okay, great. And, you know, I think that um, this is, this makes, the only thing that I'm, that I'm quite hopeful about um, is, is the possibility of all of these convention centers and coliseums and stadiums becoming polling locations. And I, and I think that people don't, when they criticize those choices, um, like one massive polling location for so many people, they don't consider all of the benefits that come with those spaces. So airflow is obviously good in those places because they have to contain hundreds of thousands of people. Um, they're generally open to the outside. They have several entrances that you can use. They also have a built-in staff who will be getting paid that day to clean the facilities, to do crowd control, to make sure that the lines are moving, to check people in. They, they sort of come with built-in poll workers. Um, and so I think that counties and states have made really smart decisions when they choose to make those places and to sort of pop up polls. Um, so anyway, but I would also love to talk about vote by mail. And I know that you have a couple, ha, ah, this is your favorite thing to talk about. Um, so I know you have a couple of slides. So I, I would love to go through those because I just want to make sure that everybody is sort of on the same page when we talk about what vote by mail is. Um, and, and I know that your first, first slide says vote by mail slash absentee. So I would love for you to address the burning question of whether or not these two things are even different. And I'm sure you'll get to that. But anyway, let's go for it. Yeah, so um, I think it is really important to know that for the vast majority of states, vote by mail and absentee are exactly one in the same thing. Um, they are interchangeable in many, many states. In, in, as I mentioned, the vast majority of states, there's no distinction. It is the case that absentee voting is what all states used to call it. But as we've had states evolve, and you can go to the, um, the next slide if you want, and as more and more voters have chosen this option for getting their ballot, we know that tens of millions of voters get their ballot handed to them by their, their postal carrier, not a poll worker. Um, and traditionally, um, and you can go to the next slide if you'd like, thank you. Um, so the states have kind of evolved. So we used to have that the entire country had absentee voting um, as, a, as an option. People have been voting by um, absentee, by mail since the Civil War. As the states have and you needed an excuse. As the excuse lists became longer and longer and longer, and it became more of a bureaucratic um, obstacle, and no one, quite frankly, checks to see, is this person really going to be out of town on election day? Does this person um, you know, really um, have this particular situation where they should be allowed under the law to vote by mail? No one was really checking that, and so many states dropped the excuse and meant, went to the stage where you know, no excuse voting. So we've had states that have had no excuse voting for a long time. Um, so states like Wisconsin um, and Nevada and other states where um, not large portions of the electorate have opted for that path. Um, instead, they've migrated to um, stay voting on Tuesday or in many places in the South, they've migrated towards voting early in person. But for the states that had more and more voters voting um, by mail, they found that traditionally they have to make a request for every election. And what we saw this year in the primary is that as more and more um, voters opt to vote by mail, it's hard to keep up with the application process. So the states that have um, traditionally had more and more voters voting by mail, and these are the Western states, they found that they needed to just have a permanent list because it's the same voters putting in an application for every election. And quite frankly, it costs about a dollar for um, mailing out a postcard for voters um, to apply on, to get it back by the uh, mail, to process it. And so it, it didn't make sense to continue to have those expenses when it's the same voters making the same request for every election. So that's where states have moved to a permanent early voting list. And this is traditionally in the West. So the states that um, the permanent list is now 60, 70, 80% of their voter rolls, they're a vote by mail state. 
So that's why Washington, Colorado, Utah, um, Hawaii, California have are starting to migrate towards or have already migrated towards mailing out a ballot to every voter. Um, states like Arizona, my former state, they, um, and Secretary Wyman in Washington likes to tease them because she said, you know, if you have 60% of your electorate, if your registered voters are on a permanent early voting list, you are a permanent early voting state, you just don't admit it. So um, the states that have so many voters voting by mail have migrated towards the efficiencies of just providing every voter with that ballot by mail and then um, allowing them to still have some in-person solutions if they need to. Um, and on the next stage, it shows what we've seen so far this, on the next uh, slide, um, it shows that what we've seen so far this year, so what we're looking at is the comparison of, put my glasses on so I can uh, look at this a little bit better. We're looking at the comparison of the primaries in 16 and 20. So the 16 are the blue dots and 20 are the, are the orangish red dots. So as we saw the COVID impact rolling out across the calendar year, the um, shift of voters to voting by mail in these places where they either um, mailed out an application um, or mailed out a ballot to voters, as you see in Nevada, was dramatic. So in Nevada, they had 98% of their ballots cast were cast by voters that got their ballot in the mail. Traditionally, they were at about like three or five or so percent. Um, so these states have leapt, kind of did a leapfrog of the, of, a lev of the evolution of voting by mail and are having to ramp up and scale up their, um, their systems far more quickly. But we do know that voters are adapting and adopting it. Um, on the next slide though, there was a, a study that came out recently and we'll make sure all these links are provided, um, um, a COVID report. And it, it asked voters that voted by mail in 16, are you likely um, to vote by mail in uh, 2020? And you can see the dramatic shift that's happening all across the country. But what is particularly interesting, and the reason why I wanted to include this, is when you look at the vote by mail states, your Colorado, that went from 86 this year it's down to 80%. Your Oregon, 97% down to 90%. Your Washington state, 97 down to 94%. What we're finding is that the discussions around the integrity of voting by mail, the validity of it, the security of it, is in fact um, informing how voters either trust the system or not. And so on the next slide, I think one of the, the stories here that we need to make sure everyone understands is timing. So first class mail is a two to five day delivery. Um, standard mail, which many um, in the West mail out their ballots, um, is a three to 10 day delivery standard. Um, on the next slide, please. So where this comes into play, and this gets back to that question of motivations and what is voter suppression and what is um, is actually efficiencies in um, in election administration is that the Postal Service recommends you mail out your ballot a week before it's due. Um, and then on the next slide, we see that there are almost half of the states allow a voter to request their ballot after the timeline that the Postal Service says to mail it back in. So there are, I think it's seven states here, allow you to request a ballot on Monday to be mailed to you for Tuesday's election. It, it doesn't happen that way. And that's where we have, New Mexico is checked off because they have moved their standard, um, their, their request deadline. Um, but states like Ohio are trying to move their date because right now you can request a ballot by mail on Saturday by noon for Tuesday's election. And it, it's, it's almost insurmountable to even get the ballot to a voter in time, but yet there's pressure. So when we're talking about vote by mail, when we're talking about early voting, if we continue to focus on the deadlines and the deadlines far too often don't set up the voter to succeed, um, we're missing the real story here and we're, we're further exacerbating a situation. Um, and then the next slide, pulls us into um, something that happened recently. So we have a new postmaster general and um, it takes a long time to change delivery standards or the rates in which um, our mail is, um, is transmitted, what we have to pay for postage. 
But what has happened is that the Postmaster General issued a directive, and this was first reported in the Washington Post um, back on the 14th. They issued a directive that says there's no overtime. Carriers are not supposed to wait for, um, for mail. Or, you know, there's, if, if there's still mail to process at the end of the day, shut off the lights and go home. And so on the next slide, we can see what kind of impact this might have. Um, and so when we look at the way in which the mail travels, it is no longer the case and hasn't been for half a decade that a voter putting their mail in their mailbox goes to the local post office and then to the elections office. It just doesn't. It goes to a processing plant and back again. And so at all of these stages, we have an opportunity for there to be delay now with this new directive. And so that's where it's going to be really important that as we talk about, um, about voting by mail, we set all the right expectations with our voters. If you're a national um, reporter, you're going to have um, a more complicated story to tell. But I think we can distill it down to very simple messaging of don't wait. Don't wait to check your registration. Don't wait to request a ballot. Don't wait to return it and know what options you have. Because if you're in a state that doesn't allow a postmark and you put your ballot in the mail on Monday for Tuesday's election, it's possible that it's not going to count. Um, so we need to really reinforce those messages. I think that's really interesting. And I've been really discouraged by um, a lot of journalists that I've seen you know, say essentially intimating that that moving up the deadline or telling people to cast their ballot sooner than they otherwise would is some form of suppression rather than just a necessary step to counting all of the ballots in this unprecedented time where the ballots are going to take that much longer to count. And so, you know, and I'd also like, I think, you know, we've got, correct me if I'm wrong, about five minutes-ish um, left of our, our our chat before we go to, yes, uh, we, we've got about five minutes. So what I would love to, to close this out with is, um, you know, it must be very difficult to be an elections official in this time um, when election officials of both parties across the country are trying to encourage people to vote by mail and do so safely. I think that that is, off, that is the case more often than not in states that the elections officials in that state are encouraging it rather than discouraging it. And it must be very difficult for those people doing that to constantly be messaging that while getting the message back from the president of the United States or other top Republicans that vote by mail is inherently flawed and will lead to a presidential or will lead to fraud or the uncertainty in the presidential election. And so I'm just wondering if you can talk about how you would recommend journalists sort of message that or how we can make sure to adequately cover the things that the president is saying while appropriately fact checking them and putting them into local context. I think that that's really, really critical. And it's not just election officials. I think um, candidates, political parties are also struggling with how do they turn out their voters um, in a time when um, there's this narrative happening about you know, calling into question the integrity of the vote by mail process. Um, I think we also need to make sure that as we're covering it, it is absolutely not the case that um, we're going to see a different process after election day in any of these states because after election day in every single state for every election, there are still ballots being processed and being counted. Um, canvas dates vary from three to five days is kind of the earliest section and then <laughs> California's, California's, which I don't know how they do that. They're, they're, it's, it's crazy. Um, to uh, California at the other end, which is like 28 days, I think. Yeah. So it, it is definitely the case that every election there will be um, processes and procedures. So debunking that myth that that ballots get thrown out if there isn't a close race or ballots won't get counted if there isn't a close race. And it could be, you know, vote by mail ballots or provisional ballots as well, because in this moment, we'll probably see a surge of provisional ballots this election because of some of the things I mentioned earlier, whether it's 
polling places changing and voters going to the wrong one, um, or individuals moving because of the uh, large number of evictions. As long as the voter registration lists are not being kept current by the voters themselves, and that's the other element here is that we need to make sure that voters are empowered and know what they can do to um, mitigate any challenges or any issues they might encounter. So making sure their registration is current, um, making sure that their requests are in early, understanding what some of these processes are and reporting on them. One, it's a great way to get B-roll, just saying, um, uh, that you can use. Um, so if you go and you um, are present for the logic and accuracy tests of and getting footage and understanding of how the voting equipment is being tested locally, that tends to further reinforce for the voting public that these things have been thought of. Um, there are policies and procedures in place and, um, and you have the added benefit of getting, you know, some really great shots, some really good B-roll um, and establishing that, that relationship with the local election officials. Because we need to make sure that voters, we don't want them to trust a system if it's untrustworthy, but we wanna make sure that they don't um, stay home and not participate in any way because they have the misunderstanding that it's not going to count or it's not, not worth it. Um, that's the very last thing. Um, and so we just need to make sure that the right and correct information is being disseminated, which calls us into mis and disinformation, right? So reporters need to know what's right in order to know what's wrong and call it out um, in, their, in their pieces. All right, I think we can go to Q&A. Do you want to kick us off, Claire? Yeah, I was just going to say, Tammy, I was just about to say that, which is the reason we had this session is that misinformation thrives when there's confusion. And there's so much confusion around this year. And I, this was, I learned so much. I love that diagram of the voting process. I mean, that's the other thing as journalists we have to think about, which is how can we make simple diagrams, like the flatten the curve diagram. What's mm -hmm. the equivalent of the flatten the curve diagram for voting? And that, I think, is a great example of that. But um, one of the things that made my mouth drop open is one of the questions that we have, Tammy, which is a clarification. You said that some jurisdictions have seen 100% of polling locations opt out this year with the best case scenario we've seen is 25% of polling places. Did you mean the best case scenario is that 25% of polling places are still willing to be polling places or 25% are opting out, meaning 75% of polling places are willing to be open? I think this is a data journalist asking the question. Yes, that, a great question. And that is a great question. And I probably didn't state it as, as, um, as well as I could have. So the best case scenario that I'm hearing from people is they are only having a reduction of 25% denials. So 75% of their facilities are saying, yes, you can come back. That's um, the best case scenario I've heard from anyone. The worst case scenario um, was a jurisdiction that said they had they were denied by all of their facilities. Um, and I think the average is running, you know, right around half, if not 60% of polling locations are saying you can't come back or they're putting in a stipulation that you have to provide deep cleaning after election day, which is very costly. Um, and so even though there have been um, some federal funds that have come into the space in the pandemic to pay for PPE and other things, some states spent all of that in the spring, um, putting on the, the, the primaries that they've already done. Um, and so they're scrambling for November. And I think it's important to note also that ballots mail out September 19th. In every state, military and overseas voters, ballots will be mailed out September 19th. That is not very far away. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And I've got a question for Jessica. So Jessica, you are famous for not letting go. <laughs> and you just keep <laughs> asking the questions. And this is a great question, which says, you said, Tammy, like, keep asking for context, make sure you ask different people. But maybe you're asking the questions and you're getting stonewalled. Any top tips, Jessica, for not letting that bone go? Yeah. Um, so if you get stonewalled, do not be, uh, you know, dissuade by that. Just keep asking the question. Um, but I would also say that this is when public records requests will come into play. Um, so you should send that public records request to the agency that's not answering your question because there's likely a record, um, whether that's emailed communication or in the case of like ADA surveys, those surveys are available or communication with the polling place. Um, you can probably get those questions answered through a records request that they're legally obligated to respond to. Um, and then also there are generally more than one 
resource for getting questions answered. Um, so, you know, the elections office is the elections office, but they're working in, con they're working in, you know, coordination with lots of other government facilities. Um, and so you should think about the places that work most closely with the office that isn't answering your question and see who else can also answer that question. So for example, if the city is not giving you an answer about why a polling location was closed, call the people that run that polling location during the day when it's not a polling location, whether it's a daycare facility or a school or whatever, and ask them why their polling location isn't being used because they likely know because either they initiated that removal or they were communicated to about how their polling location won't be necessary this year. Um, so there, there are always more than one person that can answer the question, but I would say that a, um, a well-articulated records request is uh, the best way to get these questions answered. And if you have never filed a records request or you're not confident in your FOIA or FOIA, FOIL skills, I'm gonna put my um, email address here in the chat box. And I've got lots of PowerPoints and sample FOIAs that you can have. Um, so if you want those, please just send me an email. And if I could jump in real quick on that, I think that I personally have had, when I was an election official, I've had facilities call in and say that they'd gotten contacted by a reporter and they didn't want bad press and that maybe they could move some things on their own internal schedule and still be a polling place. So you actually can have a, a very, very positive impact by shining light on some of the people who might be um, making it more difficult to conduct the election in a way that is best for the community. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think that that was one of the motivations for starting Election Land, honestly, was to take the problems about election administration that never get airtime and give them airtime because bad press changes minds. Um, so if you, in addition to calling the city about polling post closures, call the locations themselves, it is very likely that they're the ones that remove themselves as a polling location. And if you call and say, hey, why don't you want to be a polling location, then they might rethink that plan. Great, thank you. And this is another great question um, from somebody saying, a lot of black voters that they spoke to during the primary chose to vote in person, saying they just didn't trust vote by mail and they wanted to see their ballot go into the machine to be counted. How should reporting debunk claims that vote by mail makes elections susceptible to fraud without sounding pedantic to those who do want to ensure their votes are counted and think voting in person is the best way to do that? This is a question. It is. It's a beautiful <laughs> question. Um, and I think there are a number of ways. So if we're talking about it nationally, it's kind of one narrative. Um, if you're covering a certain media outlet that has, you know, just one state or multiple states, that's another kind of answer. Um, but to distill it down, I think that one, it's important to um, to cover how do vote by mail ballots get processed? When do they get counted? Because in reality, the vast majority of states, with the exception of a handful, on election night when those results first hit, either right at the close of the polls or some um, states allow for an hour delay or require an hour delay, those results are vote by mail ballots in many, many cases. They're the ballots that were cast early. They're the ballots that came back through the mail. So for voters that say, I wanna make sure my ballot gets counted, sometimes vote by mail are the ones that get counted first. They're not accumulated, so you know who won a race. That doesn't happen until after the polls close, but oftentimes those are the, the ones that get counted first. So doing a story on how exactly is the system secure? How exactly does signature matching work? How exactly does voter signature curing, what if the, the signatures mismatch? What happens then? Those are all really, I think, interesting stories that voters need to know and understand so that they do have trust in the system. Um, but I will also tell you that for the vast majority of voters in the states where they have a lot of vote by mail, voters drop it off at a, a drop box or at the polls on election day or at an early voting site into a ballot box. Some of that has to do with potentially this mistrust of whether or not it gets back in time. Some of it has to do with that mistrust because the state doesn't allow for a postmark or because the state doesn't prepay the, the, the um, postage return. Um, and so, and also sometimes people are procrastinators and they want to wait and not drop it off right away in case, I don't know, um, a reporter gets beat up on election night by a candidate. 
um, or the night before an election. You know, there, there are a variety of reasons why people do what they do, but we don't want them to have a behavior that's based on wrong information or a lack of understanding of the process. And that's where I think if we have stories about how are signatures matched, how how do these things happen? And also making sure that for jurisdictions where they have ballot tracking, which meant more and more states are doing now, um, they have that capacity to get a, a text message to say, your ballot came back, everything's fine, or we got your ballot, but you forgot to sign it. Um, those are all ways, and we know that, that that lead into the voters' confidence in the system. Great. And Jessica, this is a similar question saying, and they, those were some great examples, Tammy, but any other ones, Jessica, connected with this question of not only what kind of content do you recommend newsrooms create before mm -hmm. the election, and how early should newsrooms start publishing that kind of content? You should start publishing it now. And, and normally I would not re recommend that you publish this far out from election day um, because people tend to get exhausted um, with information and they stop consuming it. And, and that's, there's a danger in that. But the reason that I, that I think you should push it up is one, the voting period now is going to be longer because we're gonna be voting so much by mail. Um, and then also voting is already a hot topic of conversation, right? If you do not combat the misinformation when the misinformation is happening people will believe that and so by the time that your local news comes up and says like oh the thing you heard three weeks ago that the president said about vote by mail is false but we're just telling you about it now people are going to not really believe you and so i think that it is important to make those relationships with your election local election administrator now um they are busy people um and you know I have talked to probably 500 local election administrators in the four years that I have been covering elections. And I can only honestly think of four or five out of that large number that were completely unwilling to answer my questions. I think that election administrators uniquely see their job as interacting with the public and they see the media as a tool to help them do that. And so if you establish a relationship of trust with your election administrator that you're going to be covering on election day, that person is much more likely to communicate with you and and sort of like tell you where the problems are because they want the public to know where the problems are so that the prob that the problems can be avoided um, and so what you should start doing now meet with your local election administrator see if you can shoot film of how to use the polling location like how to use the machines that will be in the polling location how to make sure that you're safe if you do have to vote in person and if your jurisdiction is going to vote by mail then go and do those filming processes watch someone fill out a sample ballot so that voters know how to do it go to the warehouse so that they can see where the the ballots are stored and they have confidence in that physical security see if you can can be present during you know, validation and counting and film this process to the extent that it's illegal under your state law and make sure that you're sort of introducing the people who are going to be responsible to this to your audience, whether that's through a Q&A or a photo that you print of them in the newspaper or an interview that you do with them on the local television. If people can see the person that is responsible for this and trust them, then they're more, much more likely to have a good voting experience. Yeah, and I would just add to that, Jessica, you're talking about things being hot. I know everybody here wants to write great stories because they really care about democracy. But if any of you here are from the business side, let's also for a second think about search engine optimization. If you create evergreen content and your audience members are searching for how do I, is this safe? You want your content at the top of those search engines because you want people to find it, but also click on it. So I'd also say to Jessica's point, there is a moment here that will not only you'll get clicks, um, but you will also be helping democracy. So there was actually a newsroom that was talking about how glue gets dried in an election machine. And that's why when sometimes you click somebody's thing, it flips. And I was like, oh, are you going to publish that now? And they're like, no, we'll just wait till election day when that happens. And I was like, no, oh, no, no, you should be no, a no. the audiences now. So if it happens, they're like, oh, it's dry glue. Um, but yeah, that's a shift, I think, for newsrooms to think about. Um, yeah, exactly. And actually on that, um, somebody, one of our local fellows, actually, Sandra Fish from Colorado, was saying, have either of you seen great creative examples of voting explainers that people could potentially copy, be inspired by? I mean, you just showed a great one, Tammy, but any others that you might want to be able to share? 
So there are a lot that are put together that are regional or localized in their content, but the Vote at Home Institute um, is putting out a, an entire um, communications toolkit on voting by mail and it should have, uh, it's gonna be launched I think later on this week, um, if I'm not mistaken tomorrow. Um, and so the Vote at Home Institute will have all sorts of graphics, videos, clips, explainers, all sorts of content that can be used. And it'll be done at a national level that allows for, it's kind of agnostic to some of the specific things, but should be something that um, to keep an eye out for. Um, and when you mentioned the flatten the curve, there's a really good graphic that I think Common Cause put out on flattening the curve in voting. And it talks about early in-person voting as well as voting by mail. So um, those are a couple. Um, but if you are covering just a state specifically, I would go to um, both the Secretary of State's website and see if they've put some content together or their social media to see if they've put content together because many of them have. And I would also check your largest jurisdictions in your states because oftentimes um, they might have a budget that's that's bigger than the secretaries or um, um, they may have someone on hand to be able to um, to put together some of that content that you can leverage. Yeah, and I would also say that, you know, I think that the person who consistently does explainers very well on voting is Miles Parks at NPR um, and Pam Fessler as well. I think that they have really figured out how to explain things with just audio in a way that makes quite a lot of sense. Um, but you know, I would I would definitely start taking those things that Vote at Home is putting out and, and thinking hard about how you can localize them and make them more specific to your jurisdiction because there will be things that are just a little bit different um, that might be confusing for voters. Um, and I also think, you know, that that one of the best things that you can do for a voter is, um, and, and I've seen a couple of local news stations do this who have been election land partners, and I just think it's great every time, which is that they take a camera and they go and film how they are going to vote on a machine. And then they go through, they troubleshoot problems that you might see if you're a voter interacting with that machine and what explains those problems. And I think that that is so helpful for voters. And I think even in this time where we are very focused on vote by mail, we need to understand that there are large swaths of the population that will not be voting by mail. Texas, for example, has not increased vote by mail. We will be voting in person. They have extended early voting so that fewer people are in the polling location at any given time, but they are not expanding vote by mail. So in addition to explaining vote by mail procedures, we still do have to get down to the nuts and bolts of how voting in person works. Um, and, and I think that those explainers are just so valuable um, because that is, you know, for better or worse, we have lots of people right now casting doubt about the integrity of these voting machines. And so when people encounter very basic problems with a with a polling location, you know, maybe the very old screen is miscalibrated, or maybe it, the screen went blank, and now your ballot's gone. Like, these are old machines that have problems, and we have to deal with those. And if you empower voters to understand what the problems look like, um, then they'll be less intimidated by them when they go to the polls. And I think one thing to add to that about voting in person is that a, an important study or an important story to cover here is how are the election officials keeping the polling places safe? Um, and so both for people who are signing up to be poll workers, as well as for voters coming in. And that's gonna be an important element is to make sure that voters feel safe and understand when they pull it up to a polling location, if they see a long line, it could be that the long line is, is, um, is moving quickly, but everybody's six feet apart, um, and it's really only a 15, 20 minute wait. So when we talk about wait times, it's more about how long it is, not the length of a line. And so I think that's another story is to remind people that we've had this narrative for so long about lines be, long lines being a problem, being a problem, being a problem, but they're only a problem if they're not moving. The question is, you know, if there are 300 people in line and I only have to wait for 15, 20 minutes, that's not so bad. Um, if there are hundreds of people in line and I have to wait for seven hours, that's an entirely different story. Um, Great. Oh my God. I feel like we could just carry on chatting, but there's a couple of last questions, but we're coming to the end. The first one was actually a simulation that we did yesterday where we had rumors circulating on SMS that if you are standing in line, people might spit on you and it's like a harassment campaign. And the question is, how do you debunk those rumors without actually giving ideas to bad actors and other things? And I don't know if either of you have comments on that, but um, 
what, how do we do about this harassment idea that you can't debunk the fact that there's going to be harassment, but those claims can be really damaging? It, I, I know that this is the least popular answer that I'll ever give, but if there is a false claim of harassment, I would just not write this story. Um, because you're right, it does give people ideas. Um, and then also a lot of people are not going to hear that story and think, oh, well, that didn't happen. Um, people just shouldn't be introduced to the idea at all that they're going to be harassed at the polls if they're in fact not. If there are people out there harassing people and spitting on them, then cover the hell out of it, right? But if it's not <laughs> happening, then just don't cover it, right? I like the only exception to that that I would make is that if there is a theory that has just run wild in your town that has already sort of like dug its claws in and people actually think it's happening and you're getting calls from people who are freaked out by this thing that didn't happen, then do a story and say in the very sentence that it did not happen. But if if it's like a dozen people talking about this weird thing that didn't happen, then the only thing that you'll do by covering it, even if it is to debunk it, is to further that rumor. So just don't. Like, just don't. I mean, there's obviously a difference between President Trump saying something that's not true and, you know, some Yahoo who, like, owns a house in your neighborhood saying something that's untrue and you have to make those distinctions. But really, if it's a false rumor that hasn't gotten traction, just leave it alone until it gets traction and then debunk it. But until it does, just hope that it won't. Yeah, and Listen, I, would Jessica. Yeah. I would validate it with, you know, call up the jurisdiction that's supposedly happening in. And also, one critical element will be does the messaging contain specifics? A specific polling place, you know, a specific person, you know, a specific time. Those are all things that, um, that can be used to either say this is something that's happening or it's this general, vague, ambiguous um, notion that's out there. So we do have things like um, the concern around individuals who will try and infect others. Um, we also have concerns around violence at the polling place. So the message that could be um, disp dispersed to have a chilling effect on voters is there's a multitude of things that could be circulated that could have that potential. And so I think um, it's important to first find out it, are the election officials and others in official capacities hearing about this? Um, and they can usually have rovers in the field that can verify or validate um, and get back to you on whether or not is, it is in fact um, a legitimate claim or concern. And That's then what's great. being done about it. Yes. Um, I would love to bring Rachel in. So Rachel is the partner manager for uh, election land and I would love her to help people understand what they might be able to do to apply to join this incredible collaboration. Sure. Thank you for letting me chime in. Um, so uh, I just put a link in the chat to the sign up form. Um, essentially, it's a really easy process. You have to be a journalist in a newsroom to sign up. Um, and um, we will provide you with resources to help you do reporting. And then in the fall, we have a live coverage operation um, of voting which will look slightly different this year because of the amount of mail voting that's going on, but the, the functionality is the same. We collect tips from the public to find out what problems people are having. We also get access to um, voter hotline data um, that gives us a lot of um, important uh, leads about problems that are happening. And then we work directly with newsrooms to get them information so they can um, look into those tips and see what's actually happening and write stories um, about actual problems that are real problems um, happening on the ground. Um, so uh, the sign up link is there. Um, and then um, just also a note that we work with both local and national newsrooms. Our real focus is on local because we really need people um, on the ground who can help us look into specific things um, in, in specific areas, but we also work with national outlets that can, um, that are interested in looking into patterns and sort of bigger, bigger issues happening. So that's it. Thank you very much, Rachel. And thank you very much to Tammy and Jessica. Halfway through, I was like, this is excellent. And at the corner of my eye, I saw our friend John Keefe in the Slack channels being like, this, this is an excellent panel. And I was like, yes, it is. So uh, <laughs> it was, it was fun. It was really, really packed with practical tips. Um,
thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for joining us when you're both so busy. Um, but I'm sure this will have been very, very useful for people who are watching. So thank you very much for everything that you do. Thank you. Uh,